pleased to be here. It's always fun to be on a college campus where there's energy and excitement. Some of my happiest memories are my college years when I lived on soup and four hours of sleep and had a great time doing it. Does the microphone seem to be working? Are we good? Okay. You're all right. Awesome. Well, when I was in your stage, I never imagined I would be speaking at a business lecture series. Starting and owning a business was not on my radar screen at all during that stage of my life. My husband and I both come from conservative uh, backgrounds where our parents are educators and a lot of our siblings are as well. And I think we pictured kind of a conservative lifestyle of being writers for other companies and other newspapers. I fell in love with the idea of journalism when I was young and I watched a show called Eight is Enough. And probably you've never heard of it. But in the show, the dad worked at a newspaper and his daughter did as well. And I was just fascinated by the idea that there was teamwork involved and there was adrenaline as the deadline got closer and it just looked like an exciting lifestyle to me. So in sixth grade, we had an assignment to shadow a person in an industry we thought we might want to go into. So I spent the day following a newspaper reporter in Idaho Falls and we went out to uh, a bus had slid off the road, a school bus. We went out to that and took a picture and then we went back and I helped her write the story and it got published in the newspaper and I was just hooked with the idea of being part of the media, learning about something and then sharing that with the masses. And so I kind of headed that direction. Now in junior high, I was our yearbook editor and I have my, I'm still kind of proud of it, my ninth grade yearbook that I was the editor of and it's 80 pages long and it took a lot of work. There were a lot of Saturdays and after school hours and a lot of just stress for a ninth grader. It was kind of stressful. Now at the same time, the same school year, I started another project with, with my sisters. I have five sisters and they all like to make things. They're very crafty. And so we all started a, a cross stitch. You guys know what a cross stitch is. It's white fabric with holes and you weave the, the thread through it. And I, I couldn't find it this morning, but I never did finish it. I, I was gonna say a few words with my cross stitch and hang it in my room. I never finished it. And it was a lesson to me at that time that I had two projects in front of me. I had the yearbook, which was extremely difficult and time consuming. I had a tiny cross stitch, which probably would have taken about four or five hours to complete. And I completed one and not the other. Now, why did I complete this one? It wasn't that it was easier. In fact, the opposite was the case. I completed the more difficult of the two tasks. And it was because this was where my passion was, was in creating a publication something to share with my fellow students. And my passion wasn't then and is not now making crafts at all. And so I never did complete that. And you know, that's a lesson for us in life. And you can probably think of things in your own life that you've done that are difficult and maybe some simple things that you haven't. For example, maybe you've mastered the piano, yet you can't manage to keep your floor clean, okay? Or maybe you have endured maybe a tricky family situation and come out great from that, and yet you forget to go to study group. And sometimes these things, the more difficult of the task, we complete them because we're passionate about them. Einstein was a brilliant scientist, obviously. He made many discoveries and we still rely on a lot of the things that he, he put together for us. But he was someone who was often sick because he would forget to wear socks, he'd forget to bathe, he'd forget the simple things in his life. But his passion was where he would put his time. So the difficulty of a task really is irrelevant. It comes down to what you're passionate about, what you want to put your time into. And those are the types of things that you end up accomplishing in your life. It's not what's simple, it's not the easiest path, it's what you feel passionate about. And for the past eight and a half years, I've been passionate about our magazines that we've created. The first issue of Utah Valley Magazine came out in September 2000. And since then we've done 54, I believe, issues of Utah Valley Magazine. We also have a business publication that comes out quarterly. It's called Business Q. We've done 32 of those, and we also do an annual bride publication, and we've done eight of those. And then we've also done dozens of other Parade of Homes magazines and other things. And in fact, we've brought some samples that are on that window ledge over there, and I hope that when you leave, you'll grab one so that we don't have to haul them back. And you can kind of see a sample of what we've done. But I've been passionate about doing it because I enjoy it. Obviously, my whole life, I've enjoyed putting things together and um, the adrenaline of the deadlines and seeing it go from an idea to an actual publication. But through doing this, a byproduct of me being excited about it is I get to meet other people who are passionate about their industry and pursuing their dreams with vigor. And it has been a great uh, dream for me to meet them and to learn from them. So I wanted to share with you some of our covers from the past few years. 
and tell you what I've learned from each of them. Because each interview, I come away thinking, that was so interesting. I mean, I've never thought that was dull. Every time I think, wow, I learned something from them. And uh, it's enriched my life and I think our business as well to learn from all these different successful people. Uh, so I wanted to start with Lavelle Edwards. This was actually our, our third cover ever of Utah Valley Magazine. It's January 2001. He was just finishing his career as the BYU football coach. He'd done it for about 30 years. And so that's why we have the game plan for next season. It was kind of his, it's the end of this era. He's moving on to something else. And when I interview people, I like to do it in their home or office because, rather than my office, because I like to see what they have on the walls. I like to see what's on their desk. I like to just kind of observe them in their environment. And so I interviewed him in his office, and the first thing I noticed when I walked in was lots of pictures, lots of faces, different coaches he had worked with, and students, and family, just lots and lots of pictures. And so um, the interview went on, and one of the last questions that I asked him was, okay, well, after this nearly three decades of you coaching the Cougars, what do you feel like you learned the most? What's the biggest lesson that you've, you've uh, come away with? And he looked down, and there was a long silence, like an awkward silence. After a while, I was like, should I say something? Did he hear me? Um, and then he finally, just about when I was ready to say, ah, uh, we can do another question, he said, relationships. He said, I've learned that really all that matters is people. And as I look back at my career, I think of people. I don't think of wins and losses. And I don't think of uh, different plays or defensive moves. I just think about the people. And that was a great lesson for me to learn early on, is that business, is, business and life are about people, that relationships are most important. And we have found that in our business. One person we've had, we built a relationship with was named Deanne Hewish. She, until recently, was the executive director of the Utah Valley Home Builders, which puts on the parade of homes every year. Anyway, we developed a relationship with her and became her publishing arm to do her parade of homes magazine and other publications. We nurtured the relationship took care of her, tried to listen to her needs, and that relationship led to doing publishing for other home builders associations because she would recommend us. And I can trace all of that success in the home building publishing back to one relationship with Deanne Hewish. And so I, Lavelle was absolutely right that relationships with people are what matter the most and that they're what endure to the end. advance it. Next one. Sorry. So later that first year, we also did another uh, story that I learned a lot from, and I'm sure she'll get it popped up here soon. It was with Larry King. Now, he married a girl from Provo, or a woman from Provo, and they have a home here, so that's how we adopted them into Utah Valley is that they have a home here. And I was more than a little bit nervous to interview the man who's known as an expert interviewer, right? I'm thinking he might analyze my line of questioning, he might be frustrated with me, my nervousness might show. And I knew right away that it was gonna be fine because he treated me with interest and respect, he wanted to know about me, he was very, very fun to talk to. And so it, that added to the Lavelle's lesson for me. It's important, people are important, but it's also important to treat everyone with respect. I watched his show with renewed interest after that interview, and he had on Hillary Clinton the next night after our interview. And he was the same guy that he was when he talked to me, and I'm a nobody, obviously. And he was just acting like he cared about me just as much as he cared about her. And I found that to be a great, great lesson. And the humor columnist Dave Barry said that if you wanna know what kind of person someone is, watch how they talk to the waitress. Basically what he's saying is, how do you treat people in your life who are serving you or who maybe you don't think you'll see again? That says a lot about who you are. Another similar quote from Dan Reeves, who is with the Denver Broncos. You can judge a person's character by the way they treat someone who can do nothing for them. And so, and Larry King was awesome at this. He just treated people with respect and I've just watched him with interest through the years doing that. One thing that I've noticed is when I was in your shoes, when I was in college, I had classes with people in the journalism school at BYU, and I thought I probably wouldn't see most of them again, and that has turned out not to be true. I've seen many of them again, and we've taken turns being each other's bosses at different publications. We've needed favors from each other from time to time. When I go to look for a freelancer, often I turn to those people I went to college with, 
And it's just a good lesson that it's never too early to start building relationships with people because you will run into them again and you may, you may benefit from that relationship and you may not, but it's always just a good idea to treat everyone with respect and I love that I learned that from him. Okay, this is one of our, thank you, one of our business cue covers. And these two men are the co-CEOs of I Am Flash, which is one of the Valley's largest employers. They're out near the point of the mountain, and the I Am, it's for Intel and Micron. So it's a joint venture, and they make manned flash memory together. And each company has the CEO, and they work together so that each of the companies is well represented in this new venture. Well, I went to go interview them, and when we were scheduling it, I learned I could only go during midday. That's the only time they had available, and I didn't know why or anything. I headed out there and signed the visitor thing, got my badge, they gave me a hard hat, and away we went for the interview. And what I found in talking to them is the reason we met at midday is Rod, who's right here, he's with Micron, he likes to come in at 6 a.m., totally get on task, be focused, accomplish things till mid-afternoon, and then he goes home and spends the evening with his family. Now Dave, who's with Intel, has a different style. He comes in later in the morning, works with people, lots of meetings with people, and then into the evening he'll go to dinner with clients or potential employees or vendors. And so the midday thing was because that's when their lives overlap. And as I was hearing about their different work schedules, I wondered if there was ever a time, and I asked them this, if there's ever a time when they kind of resented the other. Like when Rod's been there since 6 a.m. and Dave shows up at 10.30, are you ever like, hey, I've been putting in my time, where have you been? And they said, oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We appreciate each other's strengths and we need each other. And I just thought that was fascinating because sometimes in life we gravitate to people who are kind of like us. And that may not be the best <coughs> solution because people who are different, between the two of them, they've got the business covered from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. because of their different strengths. And so in life I've, I've just started to notice and appreciate the differences that other people can bring to our company. We have about 15 employees and every person has a different personality and brings something different to the company and it's fantastic. And I really have learned to appreciate that. And that's something that you can adopt now. When you go to form a group for a group project, look for people who are different than you. That might not be your initial reaction, but those people have something to teach you. And I, that's what I learned from this fun interview at I Am Flash. Okay, Gladys Knight. This was January 05, and uh, it's a fun, fun interview. The thing I loved about her is she was so comfortable with who she was. She sat cross, she, we were on a couch, she put her legs up on the couch kind of cross-legged. She was just laughing. She was going to perform later that night, so she didn't have her hair or makeup done yet. And she was just so comfortable with who she was and the things that she thought, and I was just fascinated by it. I found that sometimes in my life I've tried to pretend that I'm some, something slightly different than who I am. For example, when we started our company, we were out of our home for the first couple years. We didn't have employees. But we tried to answer the phone like we were in a high rise, you know, like we're, we're this big company. And I remember one time, it was around the time of the Olympics, and New Skin called. I was working on a story with them. They were one of the Olympic sponsors. And I was babysitting my nephew. My nephew answers the phone when New Skin calls. And I was just dying. I was like, oh, I wanted New Skin to think we were, you know, a big business, not this little home shop, you know. And um, I was a little uncomfortable with that at first, but after seeing her, and seeing her so comfortable, and she had recently joined the LDS Church, loved to talk about that. Sometimes people don't talk about religion in, in, as much in business settings because they think it might be offensive to someone. She's totally open with that, totally fine with who she was. And since then, I've tried to be a little bit more like that. We do have an office now, and we have office hours, and you know, I, like I mentioned, 15 employees, but I still have kids. I have four little kids. And so I'm not there all the time, and I do a lot over email and over the phone. And if I take a phone call and my kids are in the background, I try not to be as embarrassed by that. I'm just like, hey, you know, I'm working from home. That's who I am, you know, because that's how Gladys was, and I really appreciated being around her. I've noticed that it's fun to be around confident people who are just fine with who they are. It makes you feel comfortable about yourself, too. This is James Christensen, and you... You may or may not know who he is. This is his art in the background. You probably would recognize his art. It has a fairy, fairy tale feel to it. It's really, really fun art. He lives here in Orem. And this interview was on the September 11th, the original one. And we had that scheduled for a week or two in advance. And I was going to go watch him paint as part of the interview. And he was painting um, just off the BYU campus at the LDS Motion Picture Studio, which is kind of by Cafe Rio. And I was going to just go. We were going to... I was going to watch him paint. We were going to talk. 
And because the day was so unusual and things were <coughs> uncertain, the BYU closed and the Elders Motion Picture Studio closed, and so we couldn't meet there, but he said, come on over to my house. So I went over to his house in Orem, and we had the TV on as we were talking because there kept being updates, and we were both interested, of course, in what was happening. And uh, what I learned from him is kind of an art term, but it also translates to life, and that's balance. He is someone who started out as a teacher, didn't have a lot of money. He would paint paintings, never kept any originals because he needed the money. But he said, I was totally fine with that. You know, I knew where I was. I knew I was a young father. I knew I was a young artist. It was great with that. And then as life went on, he was able to, he built a little cottage near Sundance that this is actually where the photo ended up being taken, was his cottage in Sundance that reflects his art. And now he's able to give his wife some of his originals for Mother's Day and things like that. And what I learned from him is just life is all about balance. Don't get too worried about one thing or the other, but look at all your roles in life and just do what you can at each one. Also what I learned from him is sometimes in your overall life balance, there will be some times of imbalance, such as if you're studying for a graduate exam, you're really focused on that, you may not do as well with your physical fitness or another role that you might have. But that's okay if you're focused on one item that will contribute to your overall balance. And that's what I learned from him. It was a lot of fun to talk to him. Okay, this is Alan Ashton. This was actually our very first issue of Business Q. Alan Ashton was one of the original founders of Word Perfect, which has changed ownership and is now, you know, essentially Novell. But anyway, he was one of the founders. And we took this picture. We actually hiked up some hills above the Word Perfect campus, which is on 1600 North in Orem. And we had him kind of perched on a ladder, and it was going to be overlooking the campus. Then when we got the photos back, there were a lot of weeds and haze and traffic, and it didn't really fit our vision. So we ended up cutting him out and putting him on a different background. But when I see that picture, I remember hiking that hill. Uh, but one thing I loved about him, he's someone like James Christensen who had had a long life and a varied career path. Uh, he was a teacher at BYU. And then he and a student, Bruce Bastian, came up with Word Perfect and launched that <coughs> company. And they ran that company for several years until they sold it. And then he became a community philanthropist. He started Thanksgiving Point with his wife, which is fabulous, really added to our community. And he's done a lot of interesting things. He even coached tennis at Orem High School, because that was just something he wanted to do. And when I interviewed him and I asked him about his um, turning points in life, I loved his answer. And that's one of my favorite questions to ask, is when you look back at your life, what are some turning points you can see? And one thing that I've noticed is a lot of times they'll mention a turning point that at the time probably wasn't that positive of an experience. It may not have been what they wanted to have happen, but it sent them in a new direction. And he talked about his different turning points and just really enjoying each phase of his life. And that was a fabulous lesson for me to learn. My husband and I both graduated in journalism, and his first job out of college was for a software company that needed a writer. And neither of us thought this was like an amazing job, but it was a job. And so he took the job, and we thought, well, this isn't really heading us in the right direction. But what he learned at that job was a lot of the things that helped us when we started our own business. He bought ads for his software company and publications, and so he was able to see things from that side. So when we started our business, he knew the business model that magazines were going after. He also knew what it was like to be sold an ad and the media kits and all those types of things. So as we look back at turning points in our lives, we would probably mention that first job of his and what he learned, where at the time it seemed like this isn't really the path that we wanted. So I think the lesson in that is just to see every new turning point as an opportunity to learn and grow, because you don't know where that path will lead, and you don't know when that experience will be of value to you on your own life's journey. Okay, and speaking of life's journey, these are, this is Kurt Hill and Dave Hunter. They own Hellstorm Entertainment. They produced Singles Ward, RM, um, Home Teachers, a lot of films like that. Funniest interview I ever did. Okay, can you just tell these guys are funny? I mean, I couldn't quite tell even when they were serious, because they would say things, I'm like, should I write that down? <laughs> Is that real? Because they were just so funny. They were laughing at themselves. They were laughing at each other. They, they told me they had this book, this little black book, where they wrote down all the things they wished they'd never done. And they said, that book is so big, and we just laugh when we look at it. And I thought, you know, here are two guys who are loving life. And things have been up and down for them. They've had some successes and some setbacks, but they were just enjoying the journey. And I tend to be someone who's maybe a little more serious-minded. But after leaving that interview, I thought, you know, that's where it's at. They're lighthearted, and they're just seeing things for, for what they are. They're making movies. They're, they're not curing cancer. They're just having a good time with, 
with their hobby, basically. And they were just a really good lesson to me in that, is just enjoy the journey, have a good time. This is Lisa Berenson, who, uh, if you're ever up late at night watching QVC, you might see her. She's on there a lot selling scrapbook supplies. Um, I've interviewed her a few times, but this was the only time we had her on the cover. This was our business queue in winter 06. Now she is best known for starting Creating Keepsakes magazine. Um, she started out as an editor at Word Perfect magazine, um, back in Word Perfect days. And she, she liked doing the magazines, but software wasn't her total passion. And as a hobby, she did scrapbooking. And so she started thinking, I should combine my two interests, my two loves. I've got the magazine side, I've got scrapbooking. So she started heading down that road. Well, everybody laughed at her. This was before there was any scrapbook stores or magazines or really supplies. It was her own inventions when she would make scrapbook pages for herself. And people just really kind of thought that was a silly idea. In fact, she went to a magazine conference and she talked to some, uh, some of the speakers there about her idea. And they laughed at her and they said, uh, what would you write about? I mean, there's really noth nothing to say about scrapbooking and that that wouldn't work. Well, she knew in her gut that this was a good idea. And so she went forward, started her magazine. It's been a huge success. Uh, several other, other scrapbooking magazines have followed her lead. And many products have come out of it. I mean, she's known by, she, a lot of people believe she's really the founder of the industry because of her giant step forward in starting that magazine. Well, a few years ago, she sold that magazine to the same person at that magazine conference who told her it was a dumb idea. I bet that was a good day. <laughs> Because she, she knew that it was going to work, and it was true. You know? And so when we have that gut instinct, if something is, this is a good idea, the best thing to do is listen to that voice inside rather than any, any other person. This is Ann Romney. This was from last summer, uh, July 08. Our, our July issue is traditionally our women's issue. So I'm always thinking about who could be a good woman to represent that issue, a woman who's just well-rounded and interesting and that our women readers would really enjoy. Well, I interviewed Mitt back during the Olympics and just was impressed with him. He is a smart guy. He's just well-spoken and really thought a lot of him. And so when he announced his candidacy in early 07, I thought, I should do Anne. She's a BYU grad. She's lived in Utah. She's, had, she's raised five kids. Great, great. You know, I was really excited about it. So I started going down the path that you're supposed to go down to get an interview. And you click on the website to put in a PR request. And you email and you call. And it can be difficult. To, to get these interviews. And, uh, but I really wanted to do it. So I just kept putting in the requests and kept being patient with it. I even wrote a note on my, a post-it note on my desk that says, Ann Romney or bust. I was like, I am getting this. And uh, I just kept kind of hitting brick walls because she was getting interviews with time and 60 minutes and obviously she would rather spend her time with them than with Utah Valley Magazine. But I just really, really wanted to do the interview. In fall, seven, there was a fundraising event that I heard she was speaking at in Salt Lake. So I paid my entry fee, went to the luncheon, it was great, and at the end I got in line to talk to her. And I just said, hey Ann, I'm Jeanette Bennett, I put in some requests, I really would love to do an interview with you, Utah Valley Magazine. And she said, great, I'd be happy to do that. Talk to my assistant right here, who I'd talked to, you know, 50 times, and uh, she'll work it all out. So um, her assistant, after hearing Ann's response, was a little bit more helpful and tried to get me that interview. But again, things were busy. They were flying all over the country. They weren't in Utah a lot. And things just weren't coming together. But I still wanted it. And as, as July 08 got closer, magazines go to the printer you know, a month or two before the issue comes out. So as it was getting closer, I thought, I am I'm running out of time, but I really want to do this. And then I heard that she and her family were going to be coming to Utah uh, for a week or two to stay in their home here and they'd be hosting President Bush. Well, I, I made so many phone calls. I called everyone who I thought knew the Romneys. I called people who I thought were related and I just, I, I was hoping one of them would actually help me get this lined up. And I finally did get told that, hey, while she's here, she does want to do the interview and um, she'll do it with you. So we just don't know when because their schedule's kind of busy and President Bush is here and uh, just kind of be on call and we'll let you know when she has a couple hours and you can come on over. So for two weeks, I walked around in a business suit with my laptop, ready. Is she gonna call? I even went to a family <coughs> reunion with this up at Sundance, making sure I had some cell phone reception because I was sure she was gonna call. Well, of course, life got busy and President Bush was there and um, she ended up leaving the state without the interview. And I was sad because I was like, this was, I was gonna make this happen, this was gonna work. 
So I still made a couple of phone calls and I, to the people, to her people, and said, I really want to do this interview. And we were so close, and I still have time to get it in for July, and I've gathered her BYU photos, and I really would like to do this. I got a call a few days later that said, hey, this is the assistant, the one I had talked to at the, at the luncheon. Anne's now in Southern California training her horses, but she has a few hours on Thursday if you want to come down. Well, I've never been happier to book plane tickets to go interview Anne Romney because I really wanted to do this. And I went down there and spent the day with her with a photographer as well and was just really so happy to meet her and to learn from her. She is a well-balanced, lovely, smart, intelligent, hardworking woman. And it was really fun to, to meet her and to learn from her. But I also learned something about myself in that persistence does finally pay off. And I tried not to be too annoying through my persistence, you know, but I just kept thinking this is something I want to do, and I just kept not giving up on it. And I was really happy that we were able to make that happen. Now this is an example of when plan A didn't go through. This is Jamie Redford. Can you see the resemblance? He's Robert's son. Looks a little bit like Robert. And Robert Redford is another interview like Anne that I want to do. Haven't done it yet, but if I come back and speak here in a couple years, I hope to be able to say <laughs> that I, I did eventually do that photo shoot and interview. But a few years ago, we were intending to do the interview. Things were looking good. And so I interviewed uh, Jamie, the son, kind of in preparation. I asked him about his father and, and had some different questions for him along those lines. And then when plan A, Robert, didn't come through, we were able to go to plan B and just make the most of it and talk about how he's the Sundance kid. And it turned into a really fun story because not very many people knew that Robert had a son that helped run Sundance. And he's a really great guy and good dad and all of those things. And he has his own causes um, and philanthropies that he's involved with. And so that was fun. And so sometimes when you have a plan B, it can be just as wonderful if you just make it as good as you possibly can. This is the last cover I was going to show to you today. This is Todd Herzog. Do any of you know him? Pleasant Grove guy, one survivor. Survivor China. He was obsessed with Survivor from the minute that show began. He had Survivor parties every Thursday, loved the show, would analyze it, rewind, study what people did, really, really into the show. And uh, he applied to be a contestant. Um, and I think it was the third time he applied that he finally got, got called to be part of Survivor China. Well, once he got there, he knew the game so well, because he had studied it so long, that he won and he got the million dollars and came back to Pleasant Grove and you know he's, he's a fun young guy um, who had a dream and it came true for him and what I learned from him is dream big I mean here's this guy from Pleasant Grove when he started dreaming he was in junior high then in high school he started a survivor club okay he was into this show and it was his dream and he just kind of steadily plugged along and did those you know sent in his application didn't get too worried if he didn't hear anything sent in an application and gradually, he got closer and closer to that dream, and it ended up coming true for him. Now, everyone that I've met and shared with you today, and there's, there's more stories I could share if we had time, but everyone is really different in a lot of ways. You know, some of them are quite formal. Some of them are very casual. Some of them work a lot, work 80 hours a week, and some of them don't work as much, maybe 15 hours a week, and they enjoy more of the laid-back lifestyle. Everyone is very unique. But there are two things I've noticed that every successful person that I've met has in common. And they are goal setting, number one, and secondly is passion, which we've talked a little bit about today. But first of all, goal setting. Um, there is just no other way around it. If you want to get somewhere, you have to know where you're going. There was a local college president who talked about how he had written down 100 of his life goals. And one of them was to be a college president. This was decades ago. And he was now a college president. And so he was talking about how, hey, you got to write down your goals. you got to get somewhere. So after I heard that from him, I brainstormed my life goals. And I could only come up with 50. And I was really straining. What do I want to accomplish in life? Since then, I've added a few more things to it. But I've been able to cross a few of the things off that I really, really wanted to do. And it's because once you write it down, your mind starts going to work on how can I make that happen? How can I turn that into a reality? You really do have to write your, your goals down. Before we started Bennett Communications, which is the name we do all these magazines under. We talked about it, my husband and I talked about it like it really existed. And we'd design letterhead and we'd just pretend, almost pretend basically that we were in business with Bennett Communications. So then when we actually did form the company, it just seemed natural. It just kind of came to be and it was really exciting for us. So think about what you want to do in life and maybe consider making your own list of what you want to have done in the next five or 10 years. Do you want to 
you know, donate to a humanitarian cause? Do you want to be a homeowner? Do you want to be an executive in a software industry? Really just write down what you want to accomplish. I recently interviewed a stay-at-home mom. Well, it's been a few years, actually. And she had struggled. They hadn't made a lot of money. She'd raised five kids. And her husband said to her, here's $20. See what you can do with it. And she set a goal. When he said that, she said, I set a goal that I was going to turn that into something big. So what she did, she went to a yard sale, and she found an antique doll that she knew was worth more than they were asking. So she bought that doll, sold it on eBay, made money, used that money to buy other antiques as she was going around. She had an eye for antiques, and gradually turned herself into one of eBay's top sellers, lady down in Provo. And she just had a goal that she just kept plowing away at, and I think that's awesome. Okay, secondly, the passion. Everyone has passion. If you want to be successful, you have to have a passion for what you're doing. And a good way to illustrate this is when I was interviewing a few years ago a man named Dave Tomisto, who is perhaps most well known for starting the Bajio restaurant chains. He's since sold out most of his, his uh, ownership in that. But he started Rose's Restaurant in Provo, and then he started Bajio, and that got built up big. And now his latest venture is that new Harley Davidson cool place, 1600 North in Orem, off Geneva Road. He uh, runs that, owns that, and also has a restaurant inside. Anyway, so I was asking him early on. Uh, what made you want to start a restaurant? And he looked at me and he said, everybody wants to start a restaurant. And I thought, no, they don't. Everyone wants to start a magazine, obviously. And we were both just so passionate about what we had done with our lives that we assumed this is the greatest thing you could do with your life. And I think it takes that kind of passion to really succeed. It's when you feel alive when you're doing something. If you think, I am the luckiest person in the world to be doing this, then you've found the right life path for you. And that's one thing that I learned from Dave that day is just... To, to have that passion, and then you will find your road to success. Now, some of the people I've interviewed, in fact, many of them, <laughs> have come from somewhat humble circumstances. <clears throat> Most of them didn't grow up wealthy. Most of them didn't have really successful parents. They were just kind of your everyday people who gradually developed this belief that they could do it. And they had setbacks along the way. Thurl Bailey, who was a standout NBA player, uh, told me he got cut from the basketball team in junior high. Can you imagine? He just didn't stop. He just kept trying out and practicing and trying to figure out how to move his tall body, and he became a great basketball player. So if you're thinking to yourself right now, yeah, that success thing works for other people. I'm just kind of ordinary. I kind of have this hang up in my background or whatever it is that you say to yourself. You need to get rid of that and say, I could do it. I can do anything. I can dream big. I can write my list of goals, and you really can move forward in that direction. I think our new president... Uh, almost new president, is a great example of that. He's younger than our presidents. He's black. He doesn't have a lot of, well, let me back up. <laughs> he didn't have as much experience as maybe some other candidates. And, and yet he thought, I can do this. And he can. We elected him. And I think he'll be a great president. And I think he just had that belief that he could do it. And look where he's come. You know, in conclusion, I want to share a quote from Teddy Roosevelt that became something that we, we hung it around our house when we were starting our business. And it just kind of made us feel like, hey, we could do it. Because we were coming from parents who were teachers who were saying, now, what's this business thing? Are you sure you want to do that? Are you going to be living in our basement? You know, and this quote kind of helped us think, hey, we can do it. So a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold and timid souls who never knew victory, who never knew victory nor defeat. And that was just a kind of a little mantra for us to say, hey, Let's get out there. Let's try something. Because at least then we'll know, you know, if it worked or not. We'll know what it was like to go down this path of pursuing our passion. And it's been just an awesome, awesome journey. And I appreciate you inviting me here today to share that with you.